have, and there is provision for that improvement within the budget that I put to Parliament in December. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Sergeant Officer, at the age of just 29, Gordon Aikman was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And after years as a healthy, athletic young man, he is now in a wheelchair and relies on visits from care workers three times a day. He is dying. Now, I was in a room with the First Minister when she met with Gordon and promised to look at the lack of MND nurses in Scotland. And I listened very closely last January when she announced plans to double the number of specialist MND nurses in Scotland. But we now know that that promise, that pledge, has not been met. Nicola Sturgeon has not kept the promise that she made directly to Gordon. And in her own words, for people living with MND, this is urgent. Time is not on their side. So can the First Minister please give a precise date for when she will deliver on her promise to double the number of specialist MND nurses working in our NHS? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say to Kezia Dugdale that um, my admiration for Gordon Aikman uh, for the way he has confronted uh, the dreadful diagnosis that uh, he was faced with and the way in which he's conducted his campaign knows no bounds. And uh, as I have done in past months, I continue uh, to be very determined to work with him and with others to make sure that we fulfil our obligation to improve health, care and indeed social care uh, for people, not just with MND, uh, but with other devastating illnesses of its type. Uh, the second point I'd make, presiding officer, I, I genuinely don't think it's fair uh, of Kezia Dugdale to say that we are not fulfilling the commitment that we gave to Gordon Aikman. The funding is being provided and health boards are in the process of recruiting uh, additional nurse specialists. Uh, the delays are to do with difficulties in recruitment and getting the right people with the right skills into post. But that process is continuing. That process is making progress. And over the next few weeks, I would expect to see health boards uh, do what they require to do to fulfil that commitment uh, to double the number of MND nurses. And the commitment, of course, was to double them, uh, but also to make sure that MND uh, nurses were funded by the National Health Services. And these are commitments that I remain absolutely committed to. I'm sorry, President Officer, but the First Minister promised that this would be in place by the end of October, and it is now January. And I, and I hear the First Minister talk about Gordon's courage. In fact, all the party leaders in this chamber have stood and had their photo opportunity with Gordon and praised him for his bravery. But he doesn't want our admiration. He didn't let the cameras into his life for the sake of celebrity. He did it to leave this world and to leave a legacy for those who come after him. Now, there are thousands of people across the country coming to the end of their lives who need support. And just yesterday, new figures were published which confirmed that at least 276 people died waiting on a social care package. Now, it is a scandal that it took a dying man to put an FOI request in to expose the scale of the social care crisis in this country. So can the First Minister tell me how her £500 million cuts to council budgets will help solve this social care crisis? First Minister, well, let me take those two issues in turn and firstly deal with the issue of MND nurse specialists. Uh, to date, this government has invested £2.4 million of recurring funding in a new specialist nursing and care fund and that includes up to £700,000 to fulfil the commitment that from uh, the 1st of April 2015, all MND clinical nurse specialists will be paid for from public funds. That is now in place, fulfilling the first part of that commitment I made 
to Gordon Aikman. Uh, as I said in my uh, earlier answer, we remain committed to ensure that the number of MND specialist nurses is doubled uh, and that that happens as swiftly as possible. Uh, and we are seeing progress. I outlined the fact that this is not about funding. This is about making sure we recruit and health boards recruit the right people with the right skills into these posts. But we've already seen progress towards meeting the goal in the five NHS boards that employ MND uh, nurses. Uh, NHS Lothian and NHS Tayside have already increased capacity. Uh, in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, two new MND specialist nurses have been appointed and they will take up their post later this month. All other NHS boards who employ MND clinical nurse specialists are in the process of recruiting additional nurses. Uh, that is the commitment that was made and that is the commitment, presiding officer, that will be delivered in full. Now, turning to the issue of social care, of course, what Kezia Dugdale didn't refer to in that question, perhaps not surprisingly, is that in the draft budget that the Deputy First Minister outlined to Parliament uh, just before Christmas, we made a commitment to build on our work to integrate health and social care, uh, the biggest reform of how we deliver health care that this country has seen since the establishment of the NHS. We committed to building on that uh, with an additional £250 million from the NHS into social care uh, next year. And that's, of course, in addition uh, to the extra money we've made available to support the integration of health and social care. Now, uh, Kezia Dugdale talked about uh, the number of hours of social care. And as the population ages, uh, as the needs of older people become more intensive and more acute, we've got to expand social care, which is exactly the reason for the budget decision that was taken. But uh, Kezia Dugdale might uh, be interested to know, if she doesn't know already, that over the past few years, we have been seeing uh, an increase in the number of hours of social care that local councils provide. Uh, so, for example, uh, in 2015, 706,000 hours a week uh, of social care provided by councils. That was up 4% on the year before and up from uh, 607,000 at the start of this parliament. We're also seeing the average hours of home care uh, received each week steadily increasing. In 2007, that was 5.6, uh, sorry, in 2000, that was 5.6 hours. Uh, last year, it was 11 and a half hours, which means that the intensity of social care is increasing, enabling more people with intense needs to stay at home. So this government has taken the action and will continue to take the action to make sure we have quality social care that protects individuals but also make sure we're protecting our national health service as well. Mr. Dugdale. Mr. Dugdale. In that long answer, there is one simple fact. The First Minister has put £250 million into the budget but taken away £500 million from the budget. It's that classic sleight of hand of the SNP government's style. And in the last 24 hours, we have seen a massive debate about the future of our council services open up. From Murray to Dundee, councils are taking tough choices because this government has left them with no alternative. And one of the most important services our councils provide is social care. And last night, on Reporting Scotland, the Health Secretary gave the game away because she admitted that there is a social care recruitment problem. She's absolutely right. We know that one in five care workers leave their job each year. I see her nodding her head in agreement again in the chamber. Low pay, poor conditions and insecure work. Paying a living wage would fix that. And it would improve the care. And it would improve the care that people receive. Now, before Christmas, the SNP government voted against Labour's plans for a living wage for care workers. But she could reverse that today. She can make a pledge to the 39,000 care workers who would be guaranteed a living wage for the first time. She can make a pledge to the thousands of people waiting for a social care package. And she could make a pledge to the 270 people and the families who died last year waiting for the support that they need. So will the First Minister guarantee today that she will introduce a living wage for care workers? First Minister. Well, firstly, in, First in, Minister, 
In terms Order. of the living, well, the terms the of the living wage, again, perhaps a fact that Kezia Dugdale is either not aware of uh, or is aware of and chooses to ignore in her questioning. Uh, this government is investing this year £12.5 million in partnership with local councils as part of a £25 million package to improve uh, wages and conditions in the social care sector. And we are determined to continue to make progress towards payment of the living wage in the social care sector. If Kezia Dugdale wants us to go uh, faster on that, then she is quite entitled to bring forward costed proposals about how we do that in the context of next year's budget and to say clearly where that money comes from. Let me return to the overall question of local government funding. The reduction in local government budgets uh, proposed for the next financial year amounts to 2% of their total revenue expenditure. 2%. And that is before we take account of the additional £250 million in social care. And of course, that £250 million uh, in social care is on top of the £500 million we're already investing over three years to support the integration of health and social care. In terms of the council tax freeze, the council tax freeze is fully funded. The Scottish Government gives councils money to compensate for not raising the council tax. And indeed, a recent SPICE report said that the council tax freeze was possibly overfunded with an estimated 106... This is... It's a spice report. Order. Presiding officer. Order. Labour. Labour are very keen to quote spice reports when it suits them. They might want to listen to this one. With 164... 0.9 million extra going to local government. So these are the facts, presiding officer. These are challenging times for everyone because of the cuts being imposed on the Scottish Government's budget. But there is here a question uh, that Labour has to address. We are in a budget process right now. So if Labour wants local government to get more money in next year's budget, because that's what we're talking about, then it has to set out where that money is coming from. Is Labour going to break its own commitment to freeze the council tax, or are they going to take money from other parts of the budget? Which is it, and when on earth are they going to tell us? Miss mm. Dugdale, Miss Dugdale, you could make this brief, and the first minister too. President, officer, the first minister, let me give her some facts. We brought forward proposals for a living wage for care workers. You voted it down. <laughs> I hear the First Minister, I hear the First Minister make commitments on lots of things. She can promise a £250 million tax break to big airline companies, yep. but she can't promise care workers a living wage. Order. It Order. says a lot. It says Wished. a lot about the priorities of this SNP government. Because the problem of council cuts isn't going away. The social care crisis isn't going away. Despite all of the waffle from the First Minister, people are dying, waiting for support. Is that really the Scotland that the First Minister wants to live in? First Minister. Well, here we have it, Presiding Officer. Any, oh, First last, Minister. any last vestiges of credibility that Kezia Dugdale and the Scottish Labour Party had have just disappeared. We're back to the mythical APD money, and today we have the fourth thing that it's going to be spent on. Firstly, firstly it was oh, education. Then it was restoring tax credit cuts. Last week in this very chamber, it was for first-time buyers' grants. And today it's for living wage in the social care sector. It is absolutely dire. That law over there clearly aren't fit to be an opposition, let alone an alternative government. But let me say quite clearly... Kezia Dugdale, because this is where it gets real for an opposition a matter of weeks away from an election. I know Labour don't think they've got any chance of winning the election and they're still trying to scrabble on to second place over the Tories, but they do have a duty to put forward detail. So I've outlined what our plans are on social care. I've outlined how we are going to work towards the living wage in social care. If Labour want to do it faster, they have to tell us how. So I challenge, I challenge 
Kezia Dugdale in the context of this budget process over the next couple of weeks bring forward costed proposals in this budget of how all of the plans she brings forward are to be funded. And if she doesn't do that, she doesn't deserve to be taken seriously by anybody. Thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I have uh, no plans at present, but in light of his announcement uh, yesterday, can I take the opportunity to wish him all the best? Ruth Davidson. Thank you very much. President Officer, this morning we learned that teacher unions are again threatening strike action over the workloads that they're facing. This on the back of a crisis in teacher recruitment in Scotland, with training places going unfilled, particularly in maths physics, computing and technology, and evidence that the attainment gap in our schools is still growing. We need to act. Last week, we on the Conservative benches published our plans to support Scottish schools. In it, we called for this Scottish Government to introduce Teach First, which is an innovative scheme, which is now Britain's largest graduate recruiter, training many of the best graduates and then placing them in some of our most challenging schools. Currently, however, they only go to schools south of the border. With teachers threatening strike, with a shortage of graduates going into teaching and with poor areas falling behind, why doesn't the First Minister back this scheme for Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, I disagree with uh, many aspects of Ruth Davidson's characterisation there of our education system, but I won't uh, go into that in the interests of, of time. Um, I, as I believe Ruth Davidson is, I'm, I'm serious about raising the standards of education in Scotland and closing the attainment gap. We see some signs of it narrowing in the upper stages of secondary school. Uh, I want to have the data and the information to make sure we can uh, set measurable uh, targets for closing it in primary and lower secondary school as well. And in that context, I said when I launched the National Improvement Framework uh, last Wednesday, I said that I close my mind to nothing that can be proven to work in terms of raising standards, and that remains my position. I, as uh, the Chamber is aware, uh, last year, round about this time last year, if memory serves me correcti correctly, visited a school in London to look in detail at the experience of the London Challenge. And I you know, accept before I say this that there will be different views to the one I'm about to express. But one of the things that somebody who was very close to uh, the implementation of the London Challenge said to me there was that the one thing they would advise to be cautious about in terms of learning from that was teach first. It hadn't been, in their experience, the thing that had made the biggest difference. Now, that doesn't mean I'm closing my mind to anything, but it does mean we'll continue to look at the best evidence of what works. And that's the spirit in which I will continue to move forward with uh, the task of improving education for all young people in Scotland. Well, Ruth Davidson. As ever on the topic of education, we seem to have an, an awful lot of warm words and open minds, but not much actual leadership. And the consequences of the government's inaction are beginning to damage our chances of improving our schools to the best of our ability. And we've looked at the numbers this week, and they show that last year alone, 100 Scottish graduates joined the Teach First programme. That's 100 trainee teachers who studied in Scottish universities who could right now be preparing to work in our schools, who were instead recruited by Teach First and will now go do some great work teaching in disadvantaged children, but in England. And it just goes to show that when it comes to our schools, this SNP government would rather export good teachers than innovate teacher training. We are losing some of our best graduates to south of the border, graduates that could be teaching in our most disadvantaged schools. The First Minister has the power to change that. Why doesn't she? First well, much, much of what Ruth Davidson said there is just arrant nonsense. Um, and, you know, we will do whatever we think works to improve Scottish education. And, you know, we're, uh, and Angela Constance has made announcements about this recently. We're increasing uh, the target intakes for uh, student teachers, um, increasing uh, by 60 primary, 200 uh, secondary. So we're increasing the number of teachers going through training. And part of the, the focus that we've put on raising attainment is actually on the quality of teachers 
going into our schools, making sure that we're reforming how uh, teachers are trained, uh, the qualification for headship that we've announced uh, recently, which will be mandatory by 2019, making sure we've got the best graduates coming through, getting the best training, going into our schools to provide the best education. So we'll continue to focus on the things that we think work. The National Improvement Framework will give us the framework to determine what we are doing, uh, whether it's working or not, or whether we need to do more. And we will, I'll set out uh, in the context of the election campaign that lies ahead, presiding officer, we'll set out over the next few weeks uh, further thoughts as to how we do this over the uh, lifetime of the next parliament. I continue to welcome views from all uh, parts of the chamber, but the National Improvement Framework is evidence that we're getting on with the job. Question three, Willard Rennie. Yeah, I'm sure all our thoughts are with the, the injured, the family and the friends of those who've lost their lives on the streets of Jakarta today. It's a reminder that I think we must all stand together against global terrorism. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, well, can I uh, echo uh, Willie Rennie's comments there? We've uh, seen uh, today another uh, terrorist atrocity and our thoughts are with those affected in uh, Jakarta. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. Uh, the Conservative Party is proposing an 18% increase in the council tax in Murray. Putting to one side the contradictions in Conservative policy, surely this shows the enormous pressure that councils across Scotland are under. The £500 million cut to council budgets will hit schools. The £500 million cut is a choice of the SNP government. So will the First Minister review that decision today? First Minister. Well, as I've outlined in uh, previous answers to uh, other leaders, uh, the Council tax freeze, as Willie Rennie well knows, is fully funded. Every year that the council tax has been frozen, uh, the Scottish Government has compensated councils for the amount they would have raised in revenue had they increased the council tax by the rate of inflation. And as I said earlier on, a recent report produced by Spice suggests that the council tax freeze may actually have been overfunded in the past few years. And the reduction in local government budgets is as a percentage of their total revenue revenue expenditure 2%. Now, I don't pretend that that is easy for any council, uh, but we live in challenging financial times. Um, and in that context, I also think it's fair to say that local government has been treated reasonably and fairly. And of course, none of what I've just said there takes account of the additional investment in social care that we've just been talking about. So we'll put forward our plans for how we take uh, the country forward, how we invest in the things that matter, how we build up social care, protect our national health service, improve education. And it's incumbent on other parties over the next few weeks to do likewise. And I tell you, it's incumbent on them to do likewise in an honest way, unlike what the Tories are doing just now, which is putting out leaflets opposing tax rises in Scotland on the very same day as their councillors and Murray are threatening to hike council tax by 18%. Yeah. <laughs> Will there any? She has many choices and the following is one of them. Even if Murray increased the council tax by just one pound, the First Minister will hit them with a one million pound penalty. That will hit schools, nurseries and council services. Will she commit today to lift the threat of that £1 million fine? It will be a double whammy, taxed by the Tories and fined by the Nationalists. Where's the fairness in that? First Minister. That will be the Tories that Willie Rennie's party propped up for the past five years in government. That will be the Tories that, helped by the Liberal Democrats, have imposed real terms cuts to the budget of this Parliament. Uh, Willie Rennie's hypocrisy on this really does know no bounds. Uh, on the question of the council tax freeze, the council tax freeze is funded. It is fully funded. What Willie Rennie is wanting us to do is to provide money to councils who freeze the council tax, but also give money to councils if they don't freeze the council tax. That doesn't seem fair on the councils that freeze the council tax. So we will put forward our proposals in this budget and for uh, the longer term in the next Scottish Parliament. And I say again, other parties have a duty to do likewise. If you want us 
to make different decisions in the context of a budget for the next financial year, then come forward with costed alternatives. If you want more money in next year's budget to go to local government, then each of the other parties arguing that case have to come to John Swinney and to this Parliament and point to the line in the budget that they want to take that money from. That's what comes with the responsibility of government, and it speaks volumes that none of these other parties even begin to understand it. Question number four, Mark Macdonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the future of renewables. First Minister. We've had numerous recent discussions uh, with the UK Government on the future of renewable energy. We've set out clearly our views on the impact of recent UK decisions, which are creating huge uncertainty for the renewable sector, uh, as well as hampering our progress towards a low carbon economy that are adversely impacting on potential employment in Scotland and creating the likelihood of increased costs for consumers. I'm Mark grateful McDonald. to the First Minister for our response. Given the continued impressive renewable output being reported in Scotland, does the First Minister share my concern that the Tories seem more interested in throttling the industry through regressive policy approaches than giving it the support that they seem to reserve uh, for the nuclear power industry? First Minister. Yes, uh, I do share that concern. I've already uh, mentioned our concerns in general. We've got particular concerns just now about the effect on the hydro sector, on onshore wind. The UK Government has badly damaged investor confidence by the premature closure of the renewables obligation on offshore wind. Their delays in the allocation round for contracts are impacting on major developments off our coast. And to add insult to injury, they've also cut the Peterhead carbon capture and storage project. Uh, Scotland's huge energy potential is at risk of being switched off by the Tories, which would be an absolute total disgrace. And I urge them to think again on all of these issues. Question five, Ken McIntosh. Thank you. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government's target for building affordable homes will resolve the housing crisis that she referred to during First Minister's questions on the 7th of January. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is clear in our commitment to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the next five years, a commitment which has been warmly welcomed by the housing sector. This commitment will also support around 20,000 jobs per, head, uh, per year and generate in excess of £10 billion of economic activity. Uh, this will build on our achievements in this Parliament of delivering more than 30,000 affordable homes, including 20,000 for social rent. Um, however, I would thank the member for his recent letter to me, in which he announced, uh, albeit it looked as if it was on the back of a fag packet, Labour's policy on housing supply for the first time. Uh, I look forward to hearing now how this will be paid for uh, and what commitment they might have on social housing, something that his leader has said they're still thinking about. Okay, uh, can I thank the First Minister for her answer, although can I suggest that her boasts about meeting affordable homes targets uh, do not square with the confession last week that she's presided over a housing crisis. She's turned a housing shortage into a housing crisis. Just, just one aspect of that crisis is the fact that there are more than one million Scots living in fuel poverty in Scotland today, struggling to afford to heat their homes this winter. Can I ask, given those circumstances, can she explain to the Chamber why her Cabinet Secretary for Finance, whispering in her ear right now, cut the fuel poverty budget in last week's budget? And will she pledge to take real action, join Labour in pledging to legislate to introduce a Warm Homes Act for Scotland? First Minister. Well, we've, we've maintained the fuel poverty budget at £104 million. We've lost £15 million from UK government funding because they've ended uh, a project. That is the reality. But, you know, that, uh, that contribution on housing, let me just remind people across the chamber, comes from a member of a party that the last time they were in government built the grand total of six council houses. Six council houses was the shining record of the last Labour administration. Order. By contrast, this Order. government has met, has met our target of 30,000 affordable homes, including 20,000 uh, for social rent. In the next parliament, if we're re-elected, we'll build 50,000 affordable homes, uh, and that will be a substantial increase. 70% of these will be for social rent, which will be a 75% increase on the number of socially rented houses we've built in this parliament. So we're the party with not just the record, but the ambition for the future on housing, and Labour are still squirming in embarrassment. Uh, in the words of Ian Gray, 
passing great housing legislation, but forgetting to build the houses to implement it. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what criteria the Scottish Government is using to allocate funding and teacher support for schools in deprived communities. First Minister. Uh, we use the SIMD index, which is a long-established set of indicators showing levels of deprivation in communities across Scotland. Uh, we use that to identify the seven authorities with the greatest concentration of primary age children living in the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. And we've worked with those authorities to agree funding for the primary schools that would benefit most. As I also announced on Monday this week, an additional 57 schools outside of those seven local authority areas have been allocated monies through the attainment fund. Again, uh, I identified by using the SIMD index. Smith. Uh, does the First Minister accept that the evidence uh, produced by experts uh, such as Professor Sue Ellis and Dr Jim McCormick confirm that the majority of deprived pupils do not in fact attain schools in the de most deprived areas? And would she therefore agree that the Scottish Government policy, which only targets selected schools and selected local authorities registering a high deprivation index, has its limitations and that a much better policy would be to target the available funds on the individual pupils. Yeah. First Minister. Yeah. Well, we are looking to target this money as effectively as possible. Um, and indeed, it is by listening to evidence and listening to views that we've extended the programme beyond the seven local authority areas to another 57 schools across, I think, another 14 local authority areas. And as I said earlier on, I think in response to Ruth Davidson, uh, we'll have uh, some further substantial proposals to put forward about how we extend the approach we are taking uh, as we get towards the Scottish election. Um, I couldn't be more clear and more serious about the commitment I'm making around educational attainment. And uh, if we are re-elected, if I'm re-elected as First Minister and I take nothing for granted, then I will be judged uh, on that, amongst other things, over the life of the next Parliament. So uh, it's in my interest, as well as in the interest, and more importantly, in the interest of young people across our country, that we do what needs to be done to deliver on this commitment. And I'm determined that we do exactly that. Thank you. May I apologise to the many backbenchers whose supplementary questions I have been unable to take today. Some of those supplementary questions were very important from a constituency point of view. But when the leader's questions and answers take 20 minutes, then that's clearly unacceptable. And can I appeal yet again to the party leaders to cut down on the amount of time that they are taking for questions and answers. That ends First Minister's questions. We're going to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.